l'opportunité de présenter mon travail. Euh, ma présentation est en anglais, mais, mais vous pouvez poser des questions en français. That said, uh, let's first do a couple words about myself. My name is Peter Rubich, and I'm a band involved of the fellow at the RCM, Institut de Recherche Clinique de Montréal, and McGill University, Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery. I have a background in philosophy, and then I did a master's degree in economics, then a PhD in political science, and another doctorate in neurophilosophy. So, Today I'm going to be talking about moral enhancement. Neurophilosophy. Neurophilosophy, yeah. So I was at the chair for uh, philosophy of science and technology uh, and at the research training group Bioethics, University of Tübingen Bioethics and Stuttgart uh, Technical University in Germany. So uh, what I wanted to say is that my qualifications are in two sectors. First is on cognitive enhancement, that's what I did my second doctorate on. So I was looking into uh, enhancement technology, so I have lots of knowledge about that. And the, the fact that I was in Tübingen was very, very helpful because they have everything there. The Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics uh, and Hurt Institute for Brain Research. So I had, had the opportunity to take courses uh, and have hands-on knowledge with brain stimulation techniques. So that was really helpful for my work and for my publications. The other stuff that I'm doing is on moral judgment. And this is what I got the banking for, how we process information when we're making moral judgments and so on and so forth. So in a sense, the work I'm presenting here is somewhere in between. So I have expertise in core enhancement. I have expertise in moral judgment. And moral enhancement is something that has been bothered me for a long time. And now I'm giving it a try, so this is a work in progress, so any and all uh, feedback is very welcome. That said, let's look at the promise of moral enhancement. A lot of <laughs> neuroscientists have been building careers on, on that. Now we finally, with the help of neuroscience, can discover what it means to be moral and make people more moral. Here is Dr. Love, Zach, a person who wrote a book, A Moral Molecule. He did work in neuroeconomics, uh, and this work was on trust games. So people are, tend to trust other people more if they're given, given intranasal oxytocin. Oxytocin is a neuropeptide. So this work, which was in the first decade of uh, well, this century, prompted a lot of people to think, well, hey, you know, like moral enhancement, this is something we could be doing. In a sense, evidence-based uh, approach to improvement of morality is not a problem. And here I'm really drawing a bit on Shuk, his seminal article in 2012 on the different ways of enhancement. What he said, it's not about neuroscience or behavior and brain sciences. The expertise is there, right? It is about us. We cannot agree on what morality is, so that's why we cannot pinpoint how to morally enhance. I'm going to challenge that. <coughs> it is about the technology, it is about the science, and it is about us ethicists. So, in a sense, there are practical limitations. Today I'll be talking about the available technologies and how they are promising and what they are delivering currently. I will also be talking about the specifics of mor what morality means, and hopefully we'll get somewhere. And just a heads up, I'm skeptical of the project of moral enhancement. However, I, I am agnostic in a sense that if I'm proven wrong, I would be first to admit it. So, uh, the Shuk in his article says that there are five potential mechanisms for moral enhancements to work. So first, we can increase sensitivity to moral features, so some sort of heightened or enhanced moral appreciation. We could perhaps increase thoughtfulness about doing the right thing, which would result in some sort of stronger moral decisions, or we could enhance correct moral judgments, either by cancelling out noise or strengthening those which are actually correct, because we are subject to all sorts of judgments. Some of them are prejudice, biases, and so on and so forth. So we can rule out biases and prejudice. That would be good, right? That would be kind of enhancement. 
we can enhance our moral motivation. Sometimes we are suffering from, you know, we know what the right thing is, but we just don't have the motivation to do it. Or more broadly enhance volition. So if we have the motivation to do it and volition to persevere uh, against all odds uh, in doing the right thing, perhaps that would be good and that would mean enhancement. So Shuk is talking about generic or general and morphic moral answers. And again, this, this troubled me because I had the impression that he's a great philosopher who, who does a lot of nice work, but he has no idea what he's talking about. So we'll be first talking about what is there on offer and what people have been mentioning in the debate of, on moral enhancement and uh, specifically on psychopharmacological intervention. I'll have to step back and here say that uh, I will not be discussing genetic enhancers because A, this is not the preview of neuroscience, B, this is totally speculative. So we know for now that there could be some insertion of, or deletion of genes, but nothing on humans that would be remotely connected to morality has been done. So there is a good review by uh, Jonas Specker and, uh, uh, and others done in Belgium. So if you want, I can send you the link to that. And it's very clear that genetic enhancements are far off in the future, if at all. So to come back to psychopharmacological interventions, we have a lot of scientifically based or evidence-based psychopharmacological interventions. And several have been mentioned in the moral enhancement debate. So they have been mentioned in the cognitive enhancement debate first. Like, oh, this could enhance you in some way or, or the other. But then people are starting to say, well, you know, this could be uh, used for moral enhancement as well. So better blockers such as propranolol have been used by people for stage fright and so on and so forth. So it's not really a cognitive enhancer but it's an enhancer of sort, because it could perhaps enhance performance. Now, research has shown that if it's given to people with PTSD, it dampens their emotional responses to frightful situations, so this is a useful drug for treatment. Then people have been saying, hey, if it dampens emotions, perhaps it can dampen the emotional arousal and allow us to uh, have more rational moral decisions. This is driven by the dual process moral, model of moral judgment. I will be talking about that um, at length afterwards, which posits that there is like two competing systems. So remember what, what the enhancement could look like. So if there is like a moral system that provides us with the right answers, and there is the, well, bias system which provides us with the wrong answers. And we philosophers often say, well, yeah, we shouldn't be emotional, right? We should be thinking clearly, rationally. So perhaps, perhaps if we use propranolol, we would be dampening the emotional arousal and that would give us a better, clearer head to do something. It does work on PTSD in most cases. However, <clears throat> In, in, the, in the case of moral enhancement, the jury is out or it most likely looks like that it's not working. So Sylvia Terbeck et al., uh, she is actually was in the Oxford group and they're very interested in all those things and they wanted to prove the dual process model and say, hey, now we have propranolol and the evidence was against that. So it did not increase morality of anyone. It did, uh, in a sense, reduce aggression or affect, but this is by itself neither moral nor immoral. So it can lead to morally positive and morally negative behaviors, depending on the context. So if your family is being attacked and you could defend them and you're, you know, dampen your aggression, then you will let them be attacked. So these are common uh, arguments, but what I wanted to, to focus on is the actual technology. Can it be used or can, cannot it be used? In this per particular case, I don't know if you watched that, myth busted. We move on. So 
selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So these are drugs which are, uh, this is a class of drugs, which is useful as in, in uh, the battle against depression. Again, it affects the brain in a multitude of ways. So there is a review, or first there was a study which also looked at how it affects moral judgment by Molly Crockett. She's also at Oxford, but not connected, so we'll ask who the crowd. Mm, so it leads to harm aversion, and there is an attenuated effect in people scoring high on empathy. So yeah, there is some effect. Again, it is at odds with the dual process model because it did not at all make people more utilitarian. We'll come back to that. So people wanted to test specifically that. One of the uh, hypotheses of the dual process model is the more rational you are, the more utilitarian you will be. So being more moral means being more utilitarian. If you dampen your affect, you dampen your emotions, that will make you be more utilitarian. Ergo, that means you will be more moral. Again, the effect depends on the model of moral judgment, which you think is correct. And again, what we have from evidence is that the effect is neither negative nor positive. Yes, okay, we can be more harmful, uh, averse to, her, to harm. However, depending on context, this is neither moral nor immoral. We move on. So, to come back to oxytocin, that was the promise. This is, this is the molecule, this is the neuropeptide that sparked, uh, in a sense, the discussion. Because it really is implicated in a lot of social behaviors. And the initial evidence which came from economics, or behavioral neuroeconomics and neuroeconomics, is that it increases cooperation, increases trust. However, other experiments which probed specifics of this cooperation soon found out that the cooperation is limited to in-group. So, white people or white men would collaborate with white men, but not necessarily with black men or Hispanic men. Or they would not collaborate with women, and so on and so forth. You get the picture. So, depending on your what you think morality is, if you think, if you subscribe to and I don't want to use harsh words, but uh, to a very subscribed notion of more of what sort of right-wing notion of what moral means, perhaps. But in our multicultural societies, this is most definitely just generating bias. Because yes, it does increase in-group cooperation, but it also increases favoritism, preemptive aggression against out-groups, out it increase, decreases cooperation with the outgroup. So, yes, it has a clear effect, and yes, it could, in terms of family units, it could be, you know, forging the, the bonds of loyalty or something like that. But for society and for morality, is this the moral answer we were, we were looking for? Not really. It's negative. Whatever model of moral judgment you look at, barring only the right-wing boarding of fascist models of moral judgment, this is bad. So, yeah. Would you define parochialism? Parochialism, parochialism. is the view that your own near environment, whether it's a village or a region or whatever, is the, the good, okay. and all else, else is hostile in your, okay. your suspicious. Group. Ça vient de paroisse, les guerres de clochers, dans les paroisses. Okay. Parochialisme en français. Merci. Yeah? All right, cool. Thank you. So, I'm going to continue with the historical excourse because theoretically speaking, on the dual process model, we could be thinking, okay, yeah, if, you know, there's the first the system two, which is reasoning. If we increase that, if we increase cognition, that could lead to moral enhancement because, you know, if you're better in cognition and you're not succumbing to your emotions, then you will be enhanced. And actually something like that was historically done. In Japan, Togo militarists had a full society agreement that diligence is a virtue, and they had means to increase diligence. 
So they actually made it mandatory for everyone working for the war effort, so all industries implicated in ammunition, weapons, and so on and so forth, they had to take amphetamines. Amphetamines are very effective. They are, uh, I have several articles about amphetamines, but I will not bore you with details about that. If you're interested, I can send you them. Uh, the issue is that amphetamines really affect the, the central nervous system. There is a debate if they grant cognitive enhancement per se, but what they grant for sure is performance maintenance and motivational enhancement. So if we come back to Shook and like, oh, if we could increase motivation, yeah, this increases motivation very nicely. And it worked. Work like a term. Japanese factory workers would kill themselves uh, by work. But in, in the end, uh, the effect of such moral enhancement was horrible. Virtually millions of people were hooked on amphetamine, and this caused the Japan amphetamine epidemic. So if any of you travels to Japan, and even as a sub uh, subscription or prescription for Adderall, which is a form of amphetamine, don't take it to Japan because you might be arrested at the airport. Because they take a very, very stern stance towards amphetamines as a result of this. The moral of this story is that we should be wary about, oh, theoretically this could work. Historically, we see that many of these interventions can be very dangerous, especially if we <coughs> take them, you know, like with open arms and say, oh, this is the, the next big thing. All right. So if you're okay with me moving on to the different type of intervention, and these are electromagnetic interventions, and there's quite a few, and neuroscience has been providing us uh, with evidence that some of them are affecting moral judgment. So first of all, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS for short, is a research tool used in neuroscience. It generates uh, a magnetic field, and by use of coils which are placed above the cranium. For so, imagine I had, imagine the coils being placed here. They can stimulate, they bypass the, the skull and stimulate the brain directly. And this has been used in different studies in neuroscience, and it's very effective. Uh, so people have been looking into TMS and moral judgment, and they found out that if you stimulate the uh, right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, so this is some, somewhere here, so above the, uh, above, I don't know what's this called in English, but here. Uh, then you have pronounced effects in one type of moral judgment, and these are the uh, economic games in which, you're, uh, in which you have unfair offers. So people re usually reject unfair offer offers. So if you say, hey, you know, I'll take eight, you take two, and you say, no, 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 that's not okay. Most people say that's not okay. And reject that offer, no one gets anything. That's called altruistic punishment. As this is what society is actually built upon. Uh, this altruistic punishment, which is third parties, which are sometimes uninterested, and going out of their way to punish transgressors. So this is diminished if this part of the brain is stimulated. So in a sense, people get more utilitarian because the utilitarian uh, answer or uh, could be, hey, take what you get that's maximizing your own gain. It, that's a very, very narrow understanding of what utilitarian means. Uh, and I think it's wrong understanding of what you do there and means. But at any rate, I'm thinking that even on a strong interpretation of what utilitarianism means, this would not amount to be, being moral. So the only effect we have on moral judgment is to reduce it, to become less moral. So TMS doesn't work. So let's look at the transcranial direct current stimulation. So that's the cheaper cousin of the transcranial magnetic stimulation. And instead of generating with high voltage, generating a magnetic field, it uses inexpensive 9-volt batteries and saline-soaked uh, 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 sponges 
as electrodes which you place on the head and then uh, low intensity current passes through your cranium and passes through your brain. And this type of stimulation does have effects. By the way, if you're interested in these types of stimulation, I have a couple of articles on that. Let me know, I'll send you, send you the articles. So again, people were looking at how this affects moral judgment. So, and they, they confirmed the result of TA, TMS. So again, if you use cathodal stimulation, uh, there is a difference between cathodal and anodal. Anodal should be excitatory. Cathodal should be inhibitory. So if you're using uh, cathodal, which is inhibitory, then again, it diminishes the rejection of unfair offers. However, this is, uh, this is a different part of the brain implicated in moral judgment, ventromedial prefrontal cortex. It is uh, roughly somewhere above your eyes. Uh, <coughs> it's really hard to stimulate that part of the brain, but people in Germany have been very successful at that. So, this type of stimulation produces more utilitarian answers. Uh, the utilitarian answers used are in the classical trolley dilemmas. So, would you sacrifice one person to save five people? We'll, we'll, we'll talk more about uh, moral judgment and models and so on and so forth later. But, in my view, these results, again, depending on the model of moral judgment, I would say that these results are negative. However, the dual process model might say, no, 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 no. This is positive. This is the viable form of moral analysis. I'll have to hurry up in order to be in time. So, deep brain stimulation, to cut the long story short, doesn't work. People have been looking into it. It has absolutely no effect on moral judgment. So, Bottom line and technical message, potential moral enhancement critically relies on the model of moral judgment that you're using. So if you think the dual process model uh, is true or correct, then there could be a way to use stimulation or something else to increase morality. So I'm going to very briefly go through several models of moral judgment. So the first one is the rationalist model, Kohlberg's model, you might have heard about that. I will not go into stages, it can come back if in the Q&A. But what I want to say is a quick recap. The model works like this. You see something, then you, you know, like reason about it, then you form a judgment, and this kicks in emotion. Uh, however, a lot of research has shown that moral judgment does not work like that. We do not first reason about stuff and then have judgment. Our moral judgments are fast, and we most likely and most often don't know how we came about in our moral judgment. So this model has been refuted. This was actually a paradigm in moral psychology for 40 years or even more. So basically, I'm going to skip this. Uh, again, a lot of people in the moral enhancement debate assume dual process model is true. So moral enhancement is either increasing cognition or decreasing emotion. But we have to get there. The second model is the emotional, uh, emotional or emotivist model. And I'll just go through the uh, how it looks. You see an event, you see something, and then your emotion, gut feeling kicks in, and then this causes your judgment, and then you might be reasoning about that or not, depending on how inclined you are to reason. However, new research, most notably the, the torture case, has put this model in doubt. So I'll briefly explain the torture case. Uh, people assumed that, okay, if there's a casual Causal, sorry, not casual, causal connection between emotion and moral judgment, then it should show up all the time. And there was a study in which American soldiers or Sri Lankan soldiers, this was a vignette, so people read a description in which American or Sri Lankan soldiers were tortured by rebels. There was a correlation between moral judgment and emotion in the case of American soldiers but not in the case of Sri Lankan children. So in the case of out-group, people say, yeah, that's wrong. They were not emotionally riled up. So it nicely dissociates and says, well, you don't need this prior to this, prior to the judgment. So this model does not work 
as well. A lot of neuroscientific evidence, I think this is uh, basically familiar to you, started from this uh, assumption that there is emotional link, and this brought the, with the use of trolley dilemmas, which I will not describe here because we don't have time, uh, and footbridge dilemma, I'll just briefly describe the footbridge dilemma in which you have to push a person onto the tracks and that's how you uh, hopefully save the five people. And the model, which is the dual process model as promised, I'm talking more about that, is we perceive an event and then there are two systems. System one is emotional, system two is reasoning and they're competing for dominance. Right? And whichever system wins, you get the judgment. If your emotional system wins, then a deontological or non-consequentialist judgment will ensue. And if your reasoning wins, then you will say, well, of course I'll sacrifice one person to save five, right? Most people, to come back to the footbridge, say they would not push the person. Uh, and when asked why they are at a loss, even though when asked by here, they would say, well, of course, I would, you know, like, save five people, right? That's good. And here, well, you, would you save five people? No, I don't want to push this person to death. So, this was very influential. The, the last, I don't know, 10 years or more, or even 15, have been under the influence of this model, so it's no surprise that the moral answer debate started off with that. However, this model is false. There is growing evidence that the basic assumption of the model does not pan out. So, a lot of work on psychopaths, ventromedial prefrontal cortex patients, and other populations shows that they are more utilitarian, but doesn't mean that they're more rational or less emotional. I think that the most damning piece of evidence against this model is that people who are drunk are more likely to be utilitarian. So it's not about reasoning versus emotion, it is about impulse control. So can you control your impulses or not? People with ventromedial prefrontal cortex damage cannot. People with, mm, with psychopathy cannot. People who are drunk cannot. So what we have been assuming as true in moral psychology simply is not. So any argument that increasing system two, decreasing system one, produces moral enhancement, false. So here is the, the famous study with uh, ventromedial prefrontal cortex damage patients that shown where the, the damage was, and they are more utilitarian, of course. Uh, they would push the person tracks and kill it. So is this more utilitarian? Again, it's questionable. This is a variation of intentional homicide when we take into account the intention. So it's the same as the trolley dilemma, but uh, actually you want to kill this person. Most people, when they hear that, say, well, no, then it's not. So there are other aspects of moral judgment in play which were not controlled for. And we'll come to that in a minute. I will skip this and come to the basic intuition model. This is how I think a neuroscience and cognitive science is showing us that moral judgment is working. So we see something happening, then we have an uh, intuitive judgment, and then we either get emotional or reason about it or both. But it's not that prior to judgment there is like you know, emotion or there's, there are different models which are intuitive. The first is the universal moral grammar, the second is the moral foundations theory, and the third is the model which I'm coming to, that's the moral heuristics model, which I will present at a, little, a bit longer. So I'll skip this slide and say basically that if we look at quick cognitions, there is, in cognitive psychology, work on so-called heuristics, rule of thumb. You cut corners. So these are quick cognitions that we use to solve all kinds of problems, and we solve moral problems. So there are two schools of work in moral heuristics. The first is the heuristics and biases, which things that heuristics lead to systematic biases. This is the work by Sunstein. He's been working on moral heuristics. And there's the second school, fast and frugal, 
heuristics that says, yeah, well, we wouldn't be using them if they were leading us to error. So if we are consciously employing our heuristics, such as in these you know, decision trees, so quick rules how to make decisions which are fit with the environment, then we won't be wrong. We can come back in the QA. I'll skip this. This is just a comparison between these two schools. And here is a bit I will just shortly explain the model that we proposed. When I say we, it's Eric Christine and myself. This is what I got funded for banting. It's the ADC approach. And uh, I'll skip this, 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 and this, and come here. So I'll be very short. The, the basic the base, very basic assumption is there are three types of moral intuitions. The first type is tracking agents. So remember the intentional homicide uh, dilemma. We are looking into the character of the person doing anything. We're also evaluating the, the action, and we're also evaluating the consequences. And ba based on whether these two or three are in line, our moral judgment, which is quick, is positive or negative. Now remember pushing the, the footbridge case. So, what kind of a person pushes someone to his death? Minus. What are you doing? You're pushing someone to his death. Minus. What are you hoping to achieve? Say five people, plus. Minus, minus, plus, minus. That's what most people say. The trolley case. What kind of person wants to say five people divert the trolley? A good person. What are you doing? You're, well, you're causing them to die, but yeah, so that could be a minus. What's the end effect? They're safe. Five. Plus, plus, minus, end effect, plus. I don't have much time to go into this. If you're interested, I can send you papers on this. But I think this has implications for moral enhancement. So any moral enhancement would have to affect all three at the same time. So if you increase your, I don't know, perception of outcomes, that would not necessarily be a moral enhancement. Secondly, you have to look at what uh, neuroscience and cognitive science is offering us. And currently these are blunt instruments. Like in the amphetamine case, people have been using amphetamines to be more motivated. They can be more motivated to commit crime. So we need specific enhancements, if they exist, for specific decisions. That can be done, and not neuroscience, but cognitive science is providing us with some tools. So, one example is the, uh, so uh, I can come back here, explain the, so th this was the, the very short explanation, but here there are specific social heuristics that are implicated in providing the raw data for the uh, intuitions. So some of them are tit for tat, so if you push me, I'll push you. Some of them are default, so if the majority, or limited majority, the majority does that, I should be doing that. And if there's a norm, you should be doing that. So, come back. Let's take the default. What is the norm in the society? If you change the norm, you change the behavior of people. So this is the example of the opt-in versus opt-out. In societies where opt-in is the norm, most people will not donate their organs. In societies where opt-out is the norm, most, most people will donate organs. So people follow the norm. What kind of moral enhancement works? Well, those that target specific decisions, not targeting, you know, I'm going to plug you full of amphetamines and now you'll be motivated to work. No, no, no. Now I'm going to increase your cognition. You could use your cognition to rob a bank, right? Now I'm going to decrease your emotions. That's all blunt. What you need is an intervention that is targeting a specific morally praiseworthy decision. In this case, donating organs. So, here, and this is sketchy, this is a work in progress, I will be discussing briefly, in three minutes, social decisional intervention. So this is not the realm of neuroscience, this is the realm of cognitive science. So, changing the default, changing the norms, 
is the first intervention that we know it works. So whatever is bad in society, we should not be pointing the finger at the specific individual and say, you're a bad person. Maybe the system in place needs to be changed. Maybe the system is providing us with bad responses. So I've mentioned the opt-in and opt-out, so I'm going to skip this. Changing moral exemplars. In societies in which people who are violent or aggressive toward the outgroup were uh, mentioned as moral exemplars, people tend to behave that way. So change what you're saying are moral exemplars and, and critically reinvestigate who your assumed moral exemplars are. Because moral judgment functions as a way of acquiring social knowledge. So we come back here. Imitate the successful. If your society says for some person that this person is virtuous, you're going to try to behave like that. Social circle. If your immediate environment holds some specific values, you're most likely to behave in line with those specific values and recognition. That which you recognize, you judge immediately as positive. That which you do not recognize, you judge immediately as negative. So most people see my name, they don't recognize it's unpronounceable, no, that's negative. If you hear, if you're, let's say, you're traveling somewhere in China and you hear French, being spoken, you will recognize it, you will immediately have a positive reaction because ah, someone speaks my language, right? This is how our social nature works. So we have to take that as potentially providing biases, yes, it does, and also potentially providing us with a target of moral enhancement intervention. So to come back to changing moral exemplars, it is extremely important to note who is the successful one in the moral realm. So this is an implication. We can, we can change that. And th this is an article I uh, quote from Science, in which they were changing, they were uh, saying that changing moral exemplars is in, uh, increasing altruistic behavior and tolerance and decreasing violence. And in the end, the fast approval decision trees. I mentioned that when I was talking about the uh, fast approval heuristics. This is totally work in progress. We know for a fact that such quick rules work in the ER. So nurses and doctors benefit from quick rules to choose which patients go to the emergency room, which patients go to uh, regular care. We know that these work. I'm working on creating specific fast and frugal decision trees based on virtue ethics, deontology, and consequentialism, and to increase moral judgment. Now, this is totally a work in progress. We'll see if I succeed anything with that. But I am uh, I'm, uh, open to any and all suggestions. And with this, I thank you for your attention.